my name is Craig Lonergan and I uh, live in Ticonderoga and I know something about the history of the pencil industry and its association with Ticonderoga. My uh, grandfather uh, worked in the mines at Graphite, New York, uh, which uh, was supposed to have been named Dixon, New York, but they ended up calling it Graphite. And uh, he was recruited, he wasn't recruited in New York, but his father was an immigrant from Ireland. And he came into Ellis Island uh, back in the, during the potato famine. And in those days, a representative from the mines here, either in Graphite or in uh, uh, Ironville, or other places in the Adirondack, or in some of the mills, they sent recruiters down to Ellis Island to get immigrants. Mm -hmm. So they uh, gave them passage on the train north, and uh, they usually uh, recruited maybe 25 or so, and they supplied them with work shoes and clothes and that kind of thing and gave them a job in the mine putting up put them up in the rooming house. The only catch was they had to register Republican. But they recruited them and they came from Poland, Germany, Italy, Ireland, uh, all those places. And when they came here they uh, carried on the same European attitudes that they had and wars and that kind of thing. So in the town of Graphite, they had to separate them uh, from each other sometimes. And they didn't speak English. And my grandfather originally was hired as a horse handler when he was maybe 14. And then later on he became the uh, bookkeeper because he knew how to read and write and he could sign for the, uh, the immigrants or checks. One of the online. interesting rooming house stories was that uh, there was a guy that kept telling people that he had bugs and uh, they he kept telling them and, and they kept staying away from him mm -hmm. and they wouldn't uh, even go in his room. And in those days, the people that lived in their rooming house, it was so crowded that in different shifts of the mines, when you came back from your shift, you crawled into bed. And the guy who was in the bed before you has gone to work. So they do the same thing in the, in the Navy and mm -hmm. certain ships. The submarines. Uh, submarines, they do mm -hmm. it that way. But that's what they did then, and he had spread the word around so nobody would sleep. And in, in those days, uh, my, my grandfather was the bookkeeper up in, into the 20s, and uh, he knew that the, the mine was going to close, so he left and became a bookkeeper in the Ticonderoga paper mill. And the, part of the reason was that they were, it was early outsourcing. The, one of the probably first examples in our economy that the, uh, the, the, in Sri Lanka, they gave away graphite and they could use it for ballasts and boats. Yeah. And then they'd unload it and it was free. So <coughs> that's one of the precipitating <coughs> factors for them decline of the graphite industry. In those days there were maybe 1,500 uh, people living in graphite. There were five bars and no church. That's Irish. And my grandfather, being Irish, thought that they should have a church and uh, they should also have a meeting house so he got the miners together and they constructed the Echo Mountain Hall. And in the Echo Mountain Hall they had square dances on Saturday night and a lot of drinking and hooping and hollering and all that stuff. 
Then uh, Sunday morning, my grandfather would go over and sweep up the empty bottles and peanut shells and all that, and then they would have church. Uh, in those days, there was no unemployment insurance, no uh, insurance for getting injured on the job and that kind of thing. So the people kept took care of themselves. Uh, there was a blind guy that worked in the mines that had become blind as a mine accident. Mm -hmm. So they continued having him work there. He was pretty good because uh, he could work in the dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but he was to cling on to the the ore carts coming out of the mill and, and uh, there were other uh, people like that that uh, just had no other alternative and the people used to to take care of them mm -hmm. themselves so they just didn't let them uh, start. You know? Although uh, they uh, were known uh, in the winter t in, the, in the winter they had ice in the mines and in the summertime uh, the they people. were people would go up there as a uh, kind of a tourist destination but the hotels would send crews up there to harvest the ice really uh, and one time nice. my grandfather they asked him to uh, show the people uh, the ice mines and he got went up there and he got lost <laughs> <laughs> so they always kidded about, about that, that he didn't know where, that, where he was going. I can remember as a kid, I, we used to live up on top of Mount Old Bell, and we used to ride our bicycles down there, and the graphite mine, or the lead mill we called it, was right there. And we would try to ride our sleds to get there long enough that we could pull right into the lead mill parking lot. Or on our bikes, we could ride right into there, and you could ride right down the back of the lead mill and go across this bridge and be right in the middle of the paper mill. And uh, in those days, when we were little kids, you could walk around in the mill, uh, and whether it was the lead mill or the paper mill. Mm -hmm. It was common practice that if your father worked on a paper machine and he forgot his lunch, mother would pack up a lunch and give it to the kid to take to your father and these little kids would come right into the middle of the mill and all kinds of machinery going on and whatever and uh, and, and give your father the lunch and we used to hang out on the loading dock a um, friend of mine's father worked in the mill and we'd go down and, and uh, listen to their stories or whatever and we'd build hideouts in the <laughs> in the mill and the skids, uh, the kids that lived over uh, on Cassie Street where the wood yard was would uh, build hideouts out of logs, mm -hmm. big log piles and the cranes would be going around picking up logs and meanwhile the kids are playing in the, the right mill. across the street was a big rooming house like four stories high, I think, mm -hmm. made of wood that they call that the lead mill block. And friends of mine lived there. And uh, that house also was gray like the, the lead mill. Everything in the lead mill was uh, black. Right. And uh, we always remember, even the, the truck would be all black. and. Uh, Graphite was all over everything, you know, all over the workers. Their clothes were all black, their faces were black until they opened their eyes or smiled and you, you could see their teeth or, you know, their eyes. But they were, it, it was quite a thing, you know, that uh, to see. And I, I always wondered what it was like when they went home to, to, to take a bath because I used to work in the lower mill which is right across the river and you know we could shower and stuff afterwards but but I don't I can't ever recall that they had a shower room in the lead mill but they might have but it was a typical dangerous thing they had big dollies and the lead was in big drums or the graphite refined and mm -hmm. they would move that around and they uh, they had a or a, a freight station 
uh, which was right in town. And uh, that's where they would take the lead there and load it on. And the, the graphite Hague's. went down through Hagen at the Hague dock, right? Yeah, they brought it down from uh, graphite to Lake George and then loaded it on rafts and brought it into Ticonderoga and then brought it down to the lead mill. The mill was where it is because of water power. There's a pond in just over the hill from graphite, that uh, Lost Pond, I don't know if it's called Lost North Pond. North Pond, the one that the Rosses used to live on. Uh, they created that little pond to filter the water from the processing in the mine so that wouldn't flow into Lake George. Okay. Mm -hmm. But today, uh, there probably could not be a revival of any of that because of Lake George. And yeah.